Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to um, introduce our H2 talk today, where we will be discussing um, clean ammonia in the future energy system. Um, we will co cover quite a broad range of topics, um, whether it be uh, through our report um, produced by Hydrogen Europe and together with our guest speakers um, afterwards. Um, may I just remind you that the webinar is recorded and both the presentation and the video recording would be made available um, after this event. Um, so do uh, please bear that in mind. And if you need any material, uh, just um, let us know. So starting off, I'll maybe put a bit this conversation into its context. Um, so as you know, ammonia is already today a global commodity of strategic importance, and it has a wide range of applications already today in the chemical industry, re refrigeration, mining and pharmaceuticals. Um, but it is its production for synthetic nitrogen uh, fertilizers, which makes it a key element of um, the uh, global food um, security. In fact, ammonia supports food production for around half of global population, with around 2.5 million tons of hydrogen being used as a feedstock to produce ammonia every year. The sector accounts for almost a third of all current hydrogen production and consumption in Europe. Um, ammonia is also in the spotlight as the potential enabler of the 10 million tons of imported hydrogen um, into Europe uh, as a result of Repower EU. Um, hydrogen as, uh, uh, as a hydrogen deriv derivative um, that already accounts for uh, 20 million tons of trade um, annually, 17 to 18 of which by ships. The logistics infrastructure needed for the, for its efficient and safe handling is largely in place, and that's a great asset. In terms of applications, ammonia could either be cracked back uh, to hydrogen um, or used directly as a feedstock and um, as an energy storage system uh, for power generation, for instance, and we'll go in, in our webinar today, we'll go into the different applications um, and give a chance to our speakers to, to explain a bit um, what those are. Um, full sustainability can only be achieved, however, if the hydrogen um, used to produce ammonia is in the first place clean. Here, different challenges and opportunities come into play, especially in the EU. If red targets are sending clear signals to domestic producers to start investing in clean uh, technologies, adequate policy measures are also necessary to avoid the risk of carbon leakage, notably uh, through the CBAM um, piece of legislation, and we'll touch upon uh, those topics um, today. Acknowledging ammonia's important role in the ramp up of the hydrogen economy, Hydrogen Europe de developed a full report analyzing both the challenges and opportunities that arise with the decarbonization of the sector as well as the new applications that are being considered for this hydrogen derivative, so direct use of ammonia. During this hydrogen talk, we will present the main conclusions of our study and follow up with a panel discussion bringing together heavyweights in the global ammonia business. Um, so um, now we will move towards um, the deep dive uh, report, which is produced by Hydrogen Europe um, and the intelligence team in particular. So I would like to give the floor to uh, Joana Fonseca, senior analyst in the intelligence team, and she will provide um, the highlights of the report. The report will be made available um, after our session. Uh, so I do invite you to, to download it. Um, there's a great amount of, of data and valuable data in it. So do uh, download it. Thank you, Joanna, the floor is yours. Thank you, Stephen. Good morning, everyone. Indeed, I'm very happy to be here today and finally get to share with you some of the, um, some of the results that we got uh, during our ammonia deep dive report. Um, I'll start by giving you an overlook at the table of contents of this report so that you can know what to expect. 
Essentially, we did a techno-economic analysis on different decarbonization pathways uh, for the ammonia production process. We cover blue ammonia and green ammonia. Um, and we also had a look at emerging new applications that go beyond the fertilizers and chemicals industry. Uh, we identified here three main uh, applications, uh, ammonia as an energy carrier for imports of hydrogen, ammonia for power generation, and ammonia as an alternative maritime fuel. Um, we, I will not be able to cover all of these applications today in this presentation due to time constraints, but uh, as Stephen mentioned, the, the, the report is already available on our website, so you're more than welcome to, to have a look at it, and also we will for sure cover these topics during today's discussion. So if we move to the next slide, I will start by giving some of the numbers. So this first slide um, highlights some of the figures that or, uh, Stephen already mentioned at the beginning. Here, what you see is the total capacity of ammonia production in the EU. Um, we currently have 32 ammonia facilities on operation, which represents almost 18 million tons of um, ammonia production capacity per year. Um, and in fact, <clears throat> the ammonia uh, sector is one of the biggest consumers of hydrogen in the entire world, and Europe is no exception, because you do need hydrogen as a feedstock to produce uh, ammonia. So these ammonia producers, the way they, uh, most of them uh, source their hydrogen is they have their own on-site hydrogen producer. So we're not talking about a sector that is only the one of the biggest consumers of hydrogen in the world. We're also talking about one of the biggest producers of hydrogen in the world. Uh, and the way this hydrogen is produced today is mostly through the conventional uh, natural gas uh, SMR process. As we know, um, a lot of CO2 emissions come with this process as well. And in fact, from the entire um, ammonia production process, the hydrogen production part of it um, stands for uh, around 90% of the total emissions of the sector. So this means that if we're able to decarbonize the hydrogen production part of the process, we uh, eliminate most of the CO2 emissions from the sector. So there's a huge potential here. Uh, however, in order to be able to do so, this means that we have to decarbonize um, around 3.2 million tons of hydrogen uh, in Europe in the, in the next years. Um, and so how can we do that? Uh, next slide, please. One of the um, alternative um, production pathways that we anal an analyzed was uh, what we call blue ammonia. So it's still uses natural gas as a feedstock, but here we also add carbon capture and storage to offset our emissions. Uh, we analyzed um, the auto, autothermal reforming process rather than an SMR process because it allows you to increase the capture rate of um, carbon, uh, and that way you can have a more sustainable uh, final product. Uh, and when we have a look at the, the costs of this uh, blue ammonia, we see that the dominating cost factor in the total levelized cost of ammonia, it's still the, the sourcing of natural gas and natural gas prices. Um, so the premium between blue ammonia and um, the conventional way of producing it without carbon capture uh, doesn't take uh, such a significant part of the total cost and can even be potentially offset by this, the, the savings that um, the operator gets from not having to pay for the, those CO2 emissions in the ETS system. So for example, with cost of CO2 transportation and storage at uh, 30 euros per ton of CO2, your blue ammonia would be able to, to break even at an ETS CO2 price of around 51 euros per, per ton of CO2. And that means those are quite uh, low uh, CO2 prices. That means that at current uh, CO2 prices, uh, blue ammonia is already cost competitive. However, um, we have to take uh, note that this is considering this specific um, cost for CO2 transportation and storage, um, which is a factor that can become higher uh, depending on, on different, um, different factors. But for example, the location of the facility, uh, if the facilities are not close to a storage site, for example, these CO2 transportation and storage costs can uh, significantly increase and then uh, make it more difficult for blue ammonia to be cost per, 
uh, cost competitive against the conventional production way. Next slide. So the other alternative way that we analyzed was green ammonia. So here you have green hydrogen. Um, so hydrogen from electrolysis and from renewable uh, energy sources. Um, again, and not surprisingly, the hydrogen cost, um, the, the cost of hydrogen supply is still the dominating factor of the entire levelized cost of ammonia. Um, and um, so in order to see how, what it takes to be cost competitive with the conventional way of producing it, uh, it's quite tied to the natural gas prices, right? Because that's also what's setting the benchmark for the SMR production. So for example, um, if we consider the prices that we see uh, today of natural uh, gas at 50 euros per megawatt hour, um, your green ammonia would need a hydrogen supply cost of three euros per kilogram uh, in order to break even. Uh, which already uh, quite um, more positive than what we had before the war and before the energy crisis, where where um, prices of natural gas were at 20 euros per megawatt hour, for example, and there you had a break-even points of 1.6 euros per kilogram for hydrogen uh, supply, which is extremely challenging, specific, especially considering that we're talking about hydrogen supply as a whole. So that includes not only production of hydrogen, but um, also the costs of uh, transporting that hydrogen via pipeline to your facility, for example. So it would be quite challenging. Um, uh, however, there are other factors also weighing in and uh, improving the, the business case, which is the, um, the ETS CO2 price, which was mentioned before as well. So, for example, at current, um, we see the trend for CO2 price to move uh, very close to 100 euros per ton of CO2 right now. And uh, right there, you can already uh, raise your break-even point to 2 euros per kilogram, just uh, considering that, that factor. And then on top of that, if you also include the, uh, the ability of these facilities to receive free um, allocation, uh, free emissions allocation that they can then uh, trade in the market, that could further raise the break-even point by 0.6 euros per, per kilogram. So um, a lot of factors weigh, weigh in in the, the cost competitiveness of uh, green ammonia. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and then I'll finish uh, with uh, one of the um, end use applications that we analyzed. As I mentioned, we had a look at several of them, but I'm just going to mention one of them here. And then you are welcome to, to have a look at our report. Um, and we're also gonna be talking about them during the panel discussion. Uh, but so here I bring you the, um, the use of ammonia in the maritime sector is we did an analysis on different alternative fuels for the maritime sector in particular. Uh, and we find that for deep sea shipping, so for 90% of the total market share of the maritime sector, uh, e-fuels would be the most cost competitive option as an alternative fuel uh, compared, for example, with the compressed hydrogen or even liquefied uh, hydrogen. And then from the e-fuels that we have at our disposition, ammonia has a great potential to be one of the most cost competitive because it does not include um, any carbon in its molecular structure, meaning we wouldn't have to be uh, having a supply of CO2 in order to, to have its uh, synthesis. Um, and that is quite an advantage for ammonia, uh, especially given the, the current like, regulatory framework that is being put forward, where it seems that um, the sources of uh, CO2 for e-fuels production uh, could be quite limited uh, towards only direct air capture, for example, which extremely it's extremely um, expensive at the moment. Uh, and that would um, for sure um, have an impact in the business case of these e-fuel e-fuels, like for example, e-methanol. Um, but this is, as I mentioned, just one of the applications. Hopefully, we'll have the time to discuss uh, more of them during the discussion. So I will just finish with my uh, last slide, please. Uh, which is again to remind you that the report is available on our website. 
Uh, we hope that you enjoy the reading and uh, have a look at it after the panel discussion. But for the moment, moment, I will just give the floor back to Stephen and I hope you enjoy uh, today's uh, discussion with the panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna, uh, for your presentation. And I can only echo what you said. Do please download the report. Lots of insights um, on the entire ammonia um, ecosystem. Um, now we will move uh, towards our panel uh, discussions. I will introduce um, our speakers and then we will go into a number of questions. I will start with uh, um, Vibeke Rasmussen, uh, SVP Product Management and Certification for Clean Ammonia at Yara International. Vibeke has been with Yara since 2014, working with R&D, environmental, NPK and product quality prior to joining the newly developed Yara Clean Ammonia Unit um, in 2022. Prior to joining Yara, Vibeke worked for many years with water, waste and environmental issues within the water industry, where she also held um, several uh, management positions. Um, our next speaker will be Maria Joao Duarte, is representative uh, to the EU institutions in Brussels and the head of the Brussels Liaison Office for Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, EMEA. Prior to joining Mitsubishi Heavy Industries Group, uh, Maria Joao worked as policy advisor for different trade associations uh, in the power generation and energy storage um, businesses. Uh, Ms. Duarte represents the group in a number of European and global initiatives, um, such as the European Clean Hydrogen Alliance and the Hydrogen Council. I will then introduce Mark Stolinga, uh, business manager hydrogen for the port of Rotterdam. Mark studied chemical engineering in Delft and moved to the UK after his graduation um, to work in the industrial gas business for air products and hold, held um, subsequent roles in China as equipment sales director for Asia and India, where he was country manager. In 2021, Mark joined the Port of Rotterdam authorities as business manager with a focus on receiving terminals for hydrogen carriers and notably ammonia. The Port of Rotterdam authority is also investing, uh, investigating a central ammonia cracker with several parties in the port uh, community. I'm sure we will discuss that matter. Um, then our last uh, panelist, um, Thomas Blotsky, is in charge of EU policy, regulatory and trade affairs with uh, Grupa Azotti. Um, Grupa Azotti is one of the largest fertilizer and ammonia producers in Europe, headquartered in Poland with four ammonia production sites. Uh, Tomasz is a lawyer by training with a dual degree, um, American and Polish. He worked for a number of years in DC in trade and has been in Brussels for over 15 years, dealing with trade, energy, climate policies, focusing on hydrogen legislation in the past few years, as I think we all are. Um, so now let's start um, the discussion. I look forward to discussing various points um, regarding the ammonia ecosystem when it, we will cover the full breadth of it, uh, starting with the world production, uh, the infrastructure part and the various end uses. And I hope um, our audience um, will enjoy uh, the discussion. I will start off by saying that while we want support of the inflow of ammonia, but not just any ammonia, uh, clean ammonia, but that does not necessarily mean gray, green ammonia only, correct? In terms of domestic production, what are the alternatives that we see for the decarbonization of existing ammonia facilities? What projects do you have in the pipeline? So basically here we're looking at the decarbonization of the ammonia industry um, in Europe. Um, and I would like to hand over the floor to Vibeke um, for, for this question. And then maybe Tomas uh, can also bring his insights afterwards on that specific question. Thank you. Thank you. I, uh, I, I totally agree. I think we, it's not only green ammonia. I think to, to get these industry going and start, it's probably closer to really 
decarbonize some of the existing plants with the route of, uh, of the carbon capture. So indeed, we are uh, definitely looking at, uh, at different kinds of, uh, of ammonia production. We will, in, in Yara, we now have um, two smaller scale plants which are coming online, which one in, in Europe is in Norway. The production plant in Porsgrunn will have a pilot or a demonstration scale green plant coming online later this year. And then we're also looking at our other plants in Europe um, to what kind of, uh, of uh, decarbonization that uh, we can do on those ammonia plants. And we are definitely looking in the Netherlands to, to look into carbon capture for our soy scale plant. And, and we were also considering um, other types of uh, productions in Europe. So definitely uh, both colors, not only green. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you, Vibeka. Uh, maybe Tomas, you want to give your views on those questions, on that question? Sure, yes. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, look, I think uh, this is an excellent question, but, but before I answer it, I think we need to take a, a little step back. Uh, and the first thing is this, uh, you know, most of you know this, but but maybe it needs emphasizing that, you know, while for, for, for many members of the general public, the discussion about hydrogen and ammonia is sort of a new topic, it's a new exciting thing, you know, but for us in the fertilizer industry, it's actually nothing new, right? I mean, we have been producing uh, hydrogen and ammonia for almost 100 years. Uh, actually, almost in a, in a few years, we'll be celebrating the 100th anniversary of uh, opening up of our first ammonia plant in our headquarters in Tarno. So, you know, this is not a new topic. Uh, and it's, of course, we're, we're not alone, right? As you've pointed out in your report, there is over 17 millions of uh, capacity of ammonia production in Europe. Uh, so, you know, we have been guaranteeing uh, to the farmers, and again, because mainly ammonia has been used for production of fertilizers until recently, and still is, um, we've been guaranteeing, uh, you know, the supply of ammonia and fertilizers to our farmers for, for, for all this time. Um, and, you know, we hope to continue doing that. And of course, you know, now we have a, there's the new dawn of sort of new hydrogen production and new, new, new way of looking at the production methods. Of course, hydrogen is going to be used in new, in new applications, the new production methods uh, we're hoping to develop all across Europe, uh, you know, hopefully fossil free, hopefully with renewable energy. But again, we're looking at it from the perspective of securing the plants and decarbonizing the plants we already have. Uh, and that, of course, brings certain challenges, right? Because we have, uh, uh, there's a certain disconnect between where the, where the ammonia plants are located today and where the cheap renewable energy is located in Europe, right? So there's a disconnect where we are located and a lot of the, you've showed an excellent map actually where the ammonia facilities are placed and renewables are somewhere else. So do we want renewables? Of course, all of us want to have green hydrogen, but there's also a certain reality about whether it's possible or not possible to, 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 to go green. And so now to answer your question very briefly, is it only renewable? No, it's not only renewable, mainly because the regulations require us to get, to get the renewable electricity where we're located and that electricity might not be there in sufficient quantities. So of course we need all the new uh, all the other ways of producing clean ammonia, and that's, of course, low carbon, that's, of course, carbon capture and storage, and, of course, nuclear. So we need all the options we can have to ensure that the facilities that are already producing ammonia in Europe will decarbonize and be more climate friendly. Thank you, Tomas, uh, for that um, very comprehensive um, answer. Um, now we will move towards maybe uh, the port of Rotterdam uh, with a question for Mark. Um, so ammonia has been handled for years and is mostly known as the main feed up, feedstock for the production of fertilizers, as has been mentioned here a couple of times. Um, now it's also stepping forward as a hydrogen carrier. On this subject in particular, what are the advantages that ammonia brings compared to other solutions? Mark, you're muted. Yeah, sorry, uh, uh, Stefan. Uh, thank you very much for, for this question. Uh, clearly, um, it's, uh, it's uh, very uh, good to have uh, ammonia uh, coming to the ports. 
uh, and and the reason that it is uh, slightly easier than than other materials uh, is that there is already a uh, a good infrastructure in most cases uh, to receive uh, ammonia, uh, which means that it's uh, it's easier to handle handle and transport onwards. Um, initially, uh, of course, uh, uh, just uh, the, the the storage terminals and uh, transporting on by barge. Uh, but uh, you can also research maybe a pipeline uh, to uh, to trans transport the ammonia. Um, uh, and the good thing about ammonia is that you can use it both as uh, for direct use, so as a feedstock, but also as a hydrogen carrier. So it's uh, it's flexible in that way. Um, there is already an infrastructure in place with regards to uh, ships uh, and, and and terminals. Uh, however, of course, there is a note that if we are going to uh, receive uh, so much more uh, ammonia in the future, uh, that will need uh, new uh, assets uh, as well. So uh, in the beginning, uh, we are ready uh, to start soon. So it's a, it's a solution that we can uh, uh, activate quickly. Um, but, uh, you know, further on, uh, uh, more investments would need to be uh, made in, in the infrastructure. Um, also, of course, the, the, the ammonia process is, is very well known. Uh, so if you have to uh, uh, increase production, uh, that is uh, relatively uh, straightforward. The technology exists for more than 100 years, so uh, it's, a, it's a common uh, uh, product. Uh, also, uh, I think uh, it's, uh, it's relatively uh, uh, efficient uh, to transport uh, uh, um, ammonia uh, rather than, for example, liquid hydrogen or a uh, liquid organic hydrogen carrier, uh, where you will have to transport in, uh, in, in kilograms in mass uh, uh, quite a lot uh, uh, more in the case of LOHCs. Uh, and if you're talking at, looking at uh, liquid hydrogen, the volumes are very high and the, the ships are not so large. So that is also a lot of m movement. So from an infrastructure uh, perspective, uh, ammonia has got uh, quite a, a few uh, advantages. Okay, thank you, Mark. Um, now I'll, I'll turn back to, to, to Thomas. You you talked a bit on um, the the potential challenges. For example, you mentioned that uh, uh, a wide variety of inputs um, were needed in order to decarbonize uh, hydrogen um, hydrogen and therefore ammonia um, in Europe. And, and for example, access to a renewable energy sources and that they're not necessarily located where they are used. Maybe could you, could you um, elaborate a bit more on, on the various challenges that you see uh, for the decarbonization of, of ammonia production um, in Europe? And what are the specific challenges maybe uh, that you faced in Europe specifically? Well, thank you for the question. Uh, look, um, I think I would, uh, you know, go to maybe three or four points. Um, the first one, and it's a bit of a general one, and that's uh, for all of us uh, doing business in Europe, and that's, and I'm sorry to say this, but it's simply over-regulation. Uh, I mean, if you, and the IRA, I think, is a good, 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 good point of comparison, because if you just stop to think a little bit, you know, we've had a climate uh, regulation in Europe for almost 20 years, right? The ETS directive was adopted in 2003. It's 2023 today, so that's 20 years. You know, and the ETS was supposed to drive, one of the things it was supposed to have achieved is decarbonization in Europe and, you know, providing the funds for investments and, and decarbonizing the industry. And now the Americans come in, in, in the fall of last year with the IRA. And with one move, with one statute, they, we are concerned as Europeans that they're jumping over us, right? That they're that they're ahead, that they're um, in, incentivizing the industry to come to the United States to invest in the United States. Well, we've had twenty years of climate regulation in Europe. So, what is wrong with our regulations that Americans can do it in one move, what we haven't been able to do in twenty in twenty years? I'm just pointing this out because I think it requires a bit of thinking about how we regulate climate in Europe. So that's number one. Uh, number two. Uh, you know, of course, access to renewable energy. I mean, this is absolutely the key point. If we want to have green and, you know, the commission really wants to have green, you know, we all want to have green renewable, well, we need to have that energy. And again, uh, your map pointed this out very well. The ammonia facilities are located in very specific places, in very specific places. 
and those places need that renewable energy. But whether you have renewable energy is not a political decision, really. It's just a question of the conditions in your country. Uh, so basically, you know, it's a question of uh, how long your day is, how much sun do you have, you know, are, is it cloudy, is it not cloudy, are you in the north or in the south, because that affects how the sun hits the surface, you know, do you have a lot of wind, do you have a lot of rivers, is there a lot of rainfall, these are objective factors, these are not political decisions, right, so basically, uh, the point here again, is that the regulations around how you produce green hydrogen and the very strict requirements around renewable energy, and this of course gets us to the delegated act that we'll talk about very shortly, you know, they're very strict and that make it extremely difficult for people that are located in places where the renewable energy is not as, uh, uh, you know, it's not, it's not as abundant and the conditions are not that good. It makes it extremely difficult to, to take investment decisions, basically, uh, because we would have to invest in, 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 in energy that's maybe not as uh, uh, competitive, basically. Uh, the third point, it's about, uh, you know, the regulation of low carbon uh, hydrogen. Uh, when the gas package was adopted or rolled out, I'm sorry, in, in July of 21, the narrative around it was that the commission understands that not everybody can have renewable energy, uh, that, that it's a difficult topic and we need some other options. So the narrative was good. But then if we look specifically how that's regulated and uh, uh, you know how the incentives are done, if we look at the way the red three uh, industry targets are proposed, if we look at the net zero industrial act now, it's very clear that low carbon uh, hydrogen is being, you know, it's not being encouraged, it's actually being discouraged. Uh, so the regulation along, around low carbon hydrogen is definitely insufficient, and we need a greater recognition that this is a viable and welcome way to decarbonize. And the fourth element is the issue of passing on the costs of green products. I mean, we need to be very clear with everybody that green products will be expensive. And the question is, do we have a market for those more expensive green products? Can our consumers, uh, can our clients afford to buy them? Uh, for us, it's very important because our consumers are farmers. They're very price sensitive. The margins are not very high. So we need to have a system where green products are being incentivized and recognized. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, you, you clearly outlined uh... Four, four challenges um, for Europe, and, and maybe I could suggest we we maybe dwell a bit more on the um, red delegated acts, um, and and what do you see um, for the future? Um, should we expect acceleration in project development in the EU, or rather investments, unfortunately, um, moving um, elsewhere, like for example uh, the US? Uh, and linked to the Inflation Reduction Act um, you mentioned. How, how do you see the market um, moving um, of late and, and in the near future um, regarding that? So that's me again. Um, look, again, and I don't want to be uh, too pessimistic, right? But, uh, but uh, you know, we're quite critical of the Delegated Act for a couple of reasons. Uh, and let me just set out very briefly why. You know, I mean, we feel that the Delegated Act fails to deliver decarbonization opportunities. And for us, at least in our part of Europe, one of the main challenges is the geographical correlation. And I take you back to the same point I've already mentioned, which is our facilities are in Poland. But, you know, there are other producers in our part of Europe, in Lithuania, in the Czech Republic, in, you know, in Slovakia, Hungary, and so on. Right. And they're facing uh, the geographical and weather conditions in their country. And there are basically it's very difficult to have a renewable uh, energy project which is price competitive just because the conditions are not right, right? So all of us are in the European market. Uh, and in theory, we benefit from the common market so we can buy goods and services all across Europe. But the geographical correlation component of the Delegated Act basically cuts up the European market into different sub-markets, right? So if I'm in Poland, I can simply not have a PPA with a Spanish uh, renewable electricity producer. I cannot. So I cannot buy the cheap, affordable, competitively priced en uh, solar energy from across Europe because I'm located in a different part of Europe. So to me as a European and as a company in Europe, I mean, that's un-European, right? I mean, I am being deprived the benefits of the common market. And it's very difficult for me to understand why the commission is going down that path. Uh, the second component of this is, uh, you know, it's a waste of money. It's a waste of money because now you're forcing companies located in different parts of Europe where the conditions are not good to invest in, in renewables in those parts of Europe, right? If we already agree, and probably most of us agree, we don't have an efficient, uh, we don't have sufficient funding for renewable energy investments, 
then we should not be forcing companies to invest in renewables in countries that don't have good conditions for it because that money is wasted, right? So that doesn't make sense. And the third point here I need to point out as well, it's a waste of opportunity. If we have a few, few places in Europe where the conditions are very good, you know, in the south of Europe, you know, Denmark, North, North Sea, where, you know, offshore is, is very competitive. Why are we closing that market only to producers there? I mean, it doesn't make any sense, right? If we have identified a few spots where the conditions are good, we should actually encourage the entire Europe to invest in those places in rolling out renewables there and be able to buy them from all across Europe. So for us, it's very difficult to understand what the commission is doing. And, and, and basically, uh, and this is, I think, the main point. So those very strict conditions around the Delegated Act, when you couple them with the very specific and very high targets for uh, industry that the, the Red 3 Directive is imposing, it simply creates a drive for the delocalization and moving offshore in a large part of Europe. And we think it's a tragedy. It's a tragedy if we have ammonia plants in Europe and actually European regulations are forcing us to close them and to go abroad and import ammonia from abroad because, you know, I've just returned from Dubai a few weeks ago. You know, there are many projects there. Everybody's, uh, the whole Middle East is just waiting for us to, 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 to go green. The incentives in America are very good. They're very competitive. Uh, so why, why we have such strict regulations in Europe is very difficult for us to understand. So, sorry, the short answer to your question is, uh, I think we're still, we're still not where we should be in incentivizing the renewable, uh, the rollout of green hydrogen in Europe in terms of production, of course, because consumption is already going to start happening. Okay, thank you so much. I think you made your, your point quite clear and, and specifically on the geographical constraints linked to the uh, bidding zones. Um, I think you, you made it quite clear. And then obviously on top, um, there's the whole additionality criteria. Uh, and temporal correlation, which indeed do add um, extra costs um, to for the production of, of hydrogen. I mean, these discussions are obviously still ongoing um, in, in different way or forms, um, and, and we need to find a reasonable way of um, ensuring that uh, the, volume, the production volumes can be met um, and consumed uh, within Europe. Um, so I think um, that that we would tend to to fully uh, fully align on that. Um, then um, I will maybe move uh, to Maria Joao um, and more to the uh, manufacturing um, side of things. Um, what would you expect to find in the ENSIA, so uh, the European Net Zero um, Industry Act, and the Temporary Crisis and Transition State Aid Framework? in order to make an impact comparable uh, to the Infl uh, Inflation Reduction Act. So here again, we come back to the Inflation Reduction Act. We were mentioning it on the production side um, and now maybe more on the, on the manufacturing side of things. Um, good morning, everyone. And thank you for the question, um, Stephen. Um, I think it was already very interesting and the report comes at a very timely, um, timely moment. Um, as the MHI Group is a is a, a global uh, company, we are looking at um, all these developments with quite some excitement. We ourselves set uh, a carbon neutrality target for 2040 on scope one, two, and three emissions. Um, so, um, unlike some others, the IRA comes as a positive development. Um, uh, but also in Europe, the Net Zero Act, um, we see it as, 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 as quite positive, especially when we look at, at Europe, uh, if, we, if we put the circumstances right. Uh, we are not where we were three, four years ago. Uh, we are in a period with high energy costs, with disrupted supply chains. So it's quite incredible. Um, and for those that have been working in Brussels for uh, quite some time, it's quite incredible to see the speed um, and to see what the institutions and the commission has managed to deliver and to put forward. It is a reaction, of course, and in that sense, uh, we could have expected more earlier on, um, but still it is, it, is, it is positive. Does it bring the right and sufficient incentives for manufacturing um, in Europe? Well, it certainly gives us um, a sense of direction. 
we lose a bit the technology neutrality that we always like to be a, a, a promoter of, then we can argue if that is good or bad, but it gives us a sense of, of uh, direction there. Um, it, is, it is a good support scheme. It is missing some, some points, I would argue that uh, when it comes to, we discussed a lot until now the supply side um, of hydrogen, ammonia, and how we decarbonize those, those uh, um, uh, feedstocks. Uh, but if you look at the demand side, we are not quite there yet, and we miss uh, incentives on that side. Uh, and so all the Net Zero Act and all the, the, the frameworks that come with it are looking at, are, are missing that part. The power generation we mentioned um, is not covered at all. So from the MHI group, we are looking at these uh, um, with, with some excitement. We are partnering with European um, uh, companies to deliver on the different uh, technology options. We are world leaders in carbon capture. We have different projects everywhere in the world. Uh, we are looking into heat pumps, electrolyzers. So there is a number, of course, of these strategic technologies. Um, but, but again, we need the, the demand side to follow. We can't just stick with the supply. Um, so I guess I guess to, that would be my my take uh, from 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 the the net zero act and how this goes together with uh, with Ireland. Thank you, Joao. Um, yes, I mean I think on the uh, on the demand side, we need clear signals, and those signals um, are um, somewhere in the legislative uh, pipeline at the moment. And I think one of the challenges we have at the moment is, um, well, working on every single front on the supply side, uh, but also on the demand side and everything in between, obviously. Um, so I hope we'll have more clarity in, in, the, in the months to come um, on that specific point. Um, maybe Tomas, would would you care to answer um, same question? Uh, you were quite vocal on on red and the the challenges that we have on the production side. Um, what would be your take on uh, NZR specifically and the manufacturing side of things um, in Europe? Well, look, because again, the 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 the. I mean, first of all, I would subscribe to everything that Maria said. I mean, absolutely, all the points are very well put, and and then we're in complete agreement over it. Since our point of comparison, for some reason, again, is the IRA, uh, and again, because I'm a you know a trained U.S. lawyer, I have to say the Americans did it in a very practical way. So, you know, one of the things that I'm missing in uh, in general in our regulation and in, in in the Net Zero Act is just the simplicity of applying for the subsidies, uh, and this is one of the big problems that all the European industry uh, uh, will would tell you. And I think if you look at the reactions to the IRA. It's not the industry that's complaining about the IRA. The industry actually looks at the IRA with envy and thinking, why aren't we having the same regulations in Europe? So, and the first problem is not the availability of money, because as the commission rightly points out, you know, there is a lot of money in Europe in uh, to be had. The problem is just the complexity of getting that money. You know, the, the, the way you apply for, for, for grants, for subsidies, you know, there's a competitive bidding process, which, again, is going to eliminate from that money the people who need the money the most. Because, again, I'm going back to my point that the ammonia facilities are located in specific places. These are the people that need help, and they're not going to get it because they're not going to win the competitive bidding, because competitive bidding is going to go to the people who need it the, the least. So, the, you know, the, the, the idea of that is already problematic. Uh, to us and again it's the, the simplicity of applying for the money that's number one number two because we're talking about ammonia and i think we've already decided or at least discussed here that we need other options than just green the americans are subsidizing blue we're not doing that in europe because the commission again is is, is very strictly opposed you know it, it pays lip service to low carbon but then when you actually look at the specific regulations low carbon is being discouraged uh, so what we're missing is incentivizing blue in places where we can agree that renewables are simply not an option. Because let's keep in mind, a lot of uh, proponents of, of renewable electricity, they don't want, they don't want renewable electricity going to green hydrogen because they think there is better use for it. So, you know, there's clearly, there are clearly places in Europe where blue uh, and low carbon should be encouraged and should be helped. So that's number two. 
The third element about state aid, you know, this is a, I guess, a problematic area because it depends really where you are. But if you look at that map again, which which, which you showed at the beginning of this of this um, um, seminar, a, a lot of ammonia plants today are located in in, in 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 countries that are maybe not very rich, you know. So 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 turning all the financing to member states is simply going to divide up the European market because the different producers are not going to be put in the same place. They're not going to have the same access to the money. Uh, because again, if you're from a rich country, it's much more easier for you to uh, uh, to get the funding. So, you know, we are big proponents again of the European projects. We think the money should be at the European level. We think all European companies should be treated the same way. We're in favor of simplicity, which is very, very missing from, from the European funding. And again, low carbon and blue should be helped, should be, uh, at least the regulation should be there and funding should also be there. So these, these will be my three main points. Thank you, Tomas. Um, I think uh, we could not agree more on the simplicity uh, side of things. Uh, I think in, in Europe, we have the, uh, the tendency to make things quite complicated. Um, and, and I think, I mean, quite, quite often what one says is that, I mean, the, the US markets first and then regulates. Uh, we regulate first and then we market. Um, exactly. And that tends to be uh, a bit where we are um, at, at the moment. Um, spe speaking about the money and, and speed and simplicity, um, I would now like to, to touch upon um, the hydrogen bank. Um, and the implementation of, of CFDs um, and, and what you see the role um, that bank could have and in stimulating the, the hydrogen market in Europe. Um, maybe Vibeke, would you, would you like to take um, that question? Yes, I, and, and I think Thomas put it quite well, you know, it's, it's the, the, the... Vibeke? You muted. Can you hear me now? Yes, perfectly. Okay, sorry. I, I think um, Thomas really did summarize it well in terms of saying that what we need is, is sort of simplicity and, and not the least predictability. And I think the intention of the hydrogen bank uh, is, is, is really good. You know, it's, 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 the intention is there, but the, the fact that maybe it has instant, insufficient attention really to the really hard to abate sectors and how it could put the measures in place to really make a difference in, in these sectors and to target large scale mature projects, which I really need to get off the ground quickly. And I think we're sitting waiting, you know, and, and and right now, it's not really predictable enough to be helpful in making uh, investment decisions. There, you don't know if you get the funds, you have to go through a lengthy process of applying. Um, the budget is also really not going to encourage a lot of projects, you know. It's, it's, it's only room in the current budget for one or two of these uh, ammonia projects. They are really costly. Um, so accumulating public funding uh, projects, it also um, is needed in, in to put projects in, in place. So I think it's, uh, it's um, the intention is there, whether that will really be a mechanism to help Europe speed up. Um, that is, is really difficult to see at the moment. You know, it's, it's the, we, we come back to the IRA, it's, it's simplicity and the predictability. You know, you know, when you plan your business case, you know if you are eligible for, for it or not. It's not like you have to spend time on, on, on putting a case together and then applying for funding that you might or might not get. Okay, thank you. Okay, maybe uh, uh, Joao, you would like to to take uh, take the question and, and give your perspective on the uh, on the hydrogen bank as well. Yes, of course. Um, I mean, I cannot agree more with the Viveka and everything that uh, that was already said. Um, I would just perhaps add uh, a different angle to it. Again, we are we are looking at the supply, and I understand that in future these might change and there will be something else and so on but 
again, it's the future, it's something else. It's that certainty that is not yet there. We will be learning with the process. And of course we understand that, but we are again lacking the, we lack the opportunity and that is the advantage or could still be advantage for Europe. The IRA is great. It's simple, it's pragmatic to the point. It gives certainty, but it, it gives a certainty for the supply. Nothing is given for the uptake. Nothing is given for the off-takers. And we have to consider that we have only been talking about kind of a replacement of fossil hydrogen or fossil uh, carriers, pit stocks, by clean ones. We are not talking about going into other, uh, other domains, like replacing natural gas with hydrogen or with ammonia, which is yet another another aspect to it. So when you look at, at, at the opportunities we had uh, as Europe, and we have hopefully as Europe um, to, 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 to bring these to, to a more balanced approach is really to go and incentivize demand. Um, because the volumes that then will be created by giving certainty to off-takers will allow us to bridge that cost gap. Um, so going beyond the existing hydrogen and ammonia applications to meet the repower um, uh, EU targets is something we really need to look at and, again, look at the demand, not only focus ourselves on the supply. That would be my, my take on the hydrogen bank. Thank you, Joao. Um, I, th I think, actually, I mean, when it, when it, I understand, I mean, the, the, the challenges um, uh, that you, you all put forward. Um, and, and it's true that, I mean, the, the EU legislative system is complex. Uh, there are many files that are intertwined. It's difficult to understand exactly where you sit uh, sometimes. Um, and, and funding um, mechanisms are numerous with different funding applications, with different timelines, uh, which is true, makes it a bit complex. Um, and, and I think the, the beauty of, of the Inflation Reduction Act is, well, it's centralized uh, and a simple system. And I think that's, that's really um, what, what's um, attracting um, potentially um, uh, companies. Uh, but actually, I mean, for the hydrogen bank, um, whilst yes, it is for the moment on the supply side, I would tend to um, say that actually the, the, EU, the EU has been quite responsive on that one. When you look at it, I mean, this was part of the State of the Union speech in September, which in European terms is quite quick. Um, and yes, for the moment, the domestic leg is the one we're looking at, uh, looking into, and we are getting... Uh, quite a bit of clarity on that side, um, already looking into the um, terms of reference for the first auctions, which is under one year. Um, so it is relatively uh, relatively quick, um, yet the import leg needs completely developing. And I agree with all of you that uh, we need way more budget in it. So we will be working on, on those specific aspects um, in order to have a fully fledged hydrogen bank um, for the benefit of a sector, whether it be in the supply, and I also heard on the demand side. Thank you. Now we will um, move a bit uh, towards uh, the infrastructure um, and the infrastructure requirements um, for um, the ammonia, um, clean, clean ammonia uh, sector. So one of the ammonia advantages um, that's often repeated is the fact that it can leverage existing infrastructure. What kind of infrastructure can be leveraged? Uh, would it be sufficient for importing 20 million tons of hydrogen via ammonia mentioned in Repar EU? Or would some expansions be necessary? Uh, Mark, I think you touched upon this one a bit. So maybe you want to expand. Yeah, I can certainly expand on that. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, uh, yes, of course. Um, uh, uh, some uh, new initiatives would have to be developed. Um, if you would translate the 4 million tons uh, uh, announced in the port of Rotterdam, for example, to be uh, imported in, uh, in, in 2030, uh, this is in line with uh, Frans Timmermans' uh, um, announcement that he would like to see 10 million tons of uh, 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 hydrogen 
uh, imported in, in Europe in 2030 and, and 10 million tons uh, produced. If you would take a, a percentage of that uh, import uh, to, to go to Rotterdam based on its size, uh, then you would uh, very soon get to an amount of say 4 million tons of hydrogen equivalents. Uh, if you would translate that to uh, ammonia, you would get to around 25 million tons. I mean, that's an incredible amount. Um, and luckily, not everything will be coming in the form of um, ammonia, uh, but, but certainly that is an, a, a huge challenge and, and, and that cannot be handled with the existing infrastructure. But like I mentioned before, we, we have got a good, good start. Um, uh, if you look at the announced uh, projects in, in the board, uh, in terms of carrier, uh, you see there is one that has uh, that is focusing on liquid hydrogen. Uh, there are two that are focusing on LOHCs, and there are six uh, that that are announced that are focusing on uh, ammonia storage and and also potentially cracking. So, uh, if you focus on the terminals, um, then of course the existing terminals, if there are any in your port, in the case of of Rotterdam, there is one. Uh, you could uh, think about uh, uh, expansion. Uh, expansion can be achieved uh, in two ways, either by increasing the ship movements or, or by uh, expanding uh, the, the storage area. Um, both uh, are yeah, probably uh, possible, uh, but also uh, you, you can look at uh, existing uh, terminals uh, that are freeing up space uh, to uh, enable uh, ammonia storage uh, and, and, and throughput. Uh, and, and that would, of course, uh, be, uh, be, be possible uh, if they've got some land available or if they are uh, uh, yeah, taking down some of the uh, older uh, fossil fuel assets. Um, so uh, in, in terms of uh, possibilities um, and in terms of space needed, uh, it's not incredibly uh, uh, space intensive uh, to, to, to store and to handle uh, the, uh, the ammonia. So if you have a good infrastructure in your port, uh, you should be able to do that with, uh, with brownfield uh, uh, projects. So um, uh, having said that, I think there is a start, uh, but, uh, but certainly if, if, uh, if the volumes really start to come, uh, you will also have to do some, some new investments. Okay, thank you. And maybe could you could you give us a bit more information on the um, so understand that there is existing infrastructure and that we would need more infrastructure. Um, but how about um, retrofitting uh, existing LNG terminals? Um, could you give us maybe a bit more information on on that side? Yeah, that's a that's a tricky question, of course, in the current geographical uh, situation. Uh, as uh, it doesn't look like in the uh, you know, short to medium terms, uh, LNG terminals will be uh, available to be uh, retrofitted. Um, in, in the case of uh, Rotterdam, uh, they're sooner thinking about expanding capacity for LNG than, than, than reducing it. Um, but uh, uh, in principle, uh, the, 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 the tanks uh, could probably be, be retrofitted or could be built new uh, with a dual purpose in mind. So there are certainly uh, possibilities to, uh, to, to look at, uh, at that, um, particularly for uh, the, the, the port of Rotterdam. Uh, there, there is a, a, a large LNG uh, Terminal, but there is also a peak shaver unit uh, for uh, cases, emergency cases, and maybe that is one that that, that could be transformed a, a little bit quicker. Um, but uh, uh, in, in general, uh, I think in the current situation, uh, one would not see uh, a lot of retrofitting going on. However, to be prepared, be prepared for the future, uh, that that is certainly uh, something that you could look in, and it could be. Uh, saving uh, money if you build with uh, the future in mind. Okay, so 
If I hear you right, you're saying that technically and, and cost-wise it's possible, but given the uh, geopolitical context, that's maybe not uh, the immediate uh, priority, yet it's feasible. Correct. That is the answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, Mark. Um, now we'll uh, look into uh, trading aspects and trading aspects linked to um, legislation. Um, and so the CBAM looks set to include ammonia as one of the uh, covered products, while at the same time, other potential hydrogen carriers like methanol or LOHC are not. Um, how big of an impact um, will that have on relative competitiveness of ammonia as an energy carrier? And here we'll turn to Vivek. Yeah. Thank you. And yes, CBAB also is, is one, one of uh, the package legislation that will come, of course. And I think the intention um, it was, was good and hydrogen including in, in, in CBAM. But what and how it will impact when we see that ammonia is included as a hydrogen carrier, but not other derivatives is of course a bit early to say, but having looked at this, we see that it could of course drive how producers import you know, hydrogen because you might import derivatives which are not subject to CBAM and it might shift really sort of the, the market. Um, but whether this will happen, I think is, 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 is early to, to say yet. Um, but in, in essence, you could import carriers and then convert back to hydrogen in Europe, or you could drive production that would naturally happen in Europe to outside. So whether this will end up in a resource shuffling and, and end up that, that the regulative actually gets a, a loophole somehow is too early to say, but there is a potential. So, and then, including hydrogen into CBAM will then sort of lose its, its uh, intention, I think, if that, that happens. But right now, I, I think we, we don't know is the answer on, on that, how that will impact. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, maybe Tomas, um, do you have a view on, on that specific uh, one? Well, it's not, I mean, I absolutely share uh, Vivek's uh, comments uh, and maybe just uh, sort of more clearly to, to elaborate on two points. One is uh, you were asking about methanol. I think uh, for us, uh, you know, it's, it's obvious that if, you, if we're going into, uh, um, into the modes in which hydrogen can be, uh, can be imported, then all of them should be covered by CBAM, basically, because, I mean, if we've already decided that hydrogen needs to be covered by CBAM, uh, and uh, we have different ways of bringing it to Europe. And again, if the purpose is to bring ammonia, sorry, if the purpose is to bring hydrogen, then all of these forms should be covered. Now on liquid uh, organic hydrogen carriers, one point I wanna point out, and again, because there's a lot of discussion about how this will be treated under CBAM, uh, uh, because of course, you know the, the term uh, L, L, L O H C is 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 a bit um, a, a vague into what it actually is going to be because that's not that it's going to be an actual compound, organic compound that has hydrogen in it. But if again, if the purpose of the scheme is to bring hydrogen into Europe, take the hydrogen out and send the resulting compound back to where it came from, and then load hydrogen again, bring it back to Europe, import it, send it out, send it out, then what you're actually doing is you're bringing hydrogen. Right? You're not importing the compound you, you claim to be importing, but you're actually importing hydrogen. And if you're importing hydrogen, well, hydrogen is subject to CBAM. So if this is the way the operation is going to be operated, uh, the way we hear it being described in various uh, setups and by various companies as to how to bring hydrogen into Europe, then to us, you're bringing hydrogen. You're not bringing the other compound, and that means it should be subject to CBAM. So, of course, but as Vivek pointed out, a lot, there are a lot of questions. We don't fully uh, know yet how this will be implemented. Uh, the, the commission's still working on the implementing acts. So uh, a lot of these things are not clear today, and the way it's going to be implemented is going to be very key into how CBAM actually operates, which is extremely important for the hydrogen market and for the producers like ourselves, like Yara, like, like the other people that are trying to make it happen here in Europe. Okay, I, 
I understand that we don't have the the uh, the right um, we don't have all the necessary information as it stands, and quite a bit is sort of in in uh, in the regulatory works. Um, but that um, some sort of level playing field uh, between hydrogen and its um, derivatives, um, where they're treated in a similar way, um, is is uh, is your view, um, and and well understood. Um, now we'll go um, maybe a bit towards um, ammonia. Ammonia is a substance and its chemical properties. Um, so ammonia is, is sometimes um, characterized as a, as a dangerous substance. Um, how can we ensure that the, sa the correct safety measures are put in place when handling and transporting um, ammonia? Uh, Mark, maybe with your experience in, in the port, um, could you maybe give us uh, a bit more information? Yes, uh, I certainly can. Uh, I think I, I, I would like to focus on the fact that, uh, of course, in the port, uh, one is uh, very uh, used to handling dangerous goods. Um, and, and therefore, uh, the, the toxicity of, of ammonia, uh, the way of handling it, uh, keeping it under uh, the, the, the right uh, amount of control, uh, I think that is uh, something that the, the board can, can handle uh, quite well. Um, the, the concerns uh, are really uh, with the environment uh, and when you uh, start transporting or loading uh, uh, ammonia, uh, and, and, and clearly uh, we need to make sure that uh, all the, uh, the policies and the regulations uh, and the permitting procedures are in place uh, to deal with uh, the larger amounts of ammonia uh, as we are uh, 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 expecting them uh, to come. Uh, but in, in uh, close cooperation with the industry, like uh, 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 Yara, Fiebeke, I'm sure you'll have something to say on this as well. Um, um, I, I think we, we, we can uh, uh, deal with that. Uh, but I think more study maybe is new, needed for how are you going to transport the, the larger quantities of ammonia, if you do it as ammonia uh, or hydrogen, for that matter, if you crack it, uh, to uh, to uh, areas that, that are not connected uh, to the, the sea or, or a main river. Mm, yes, yeah, thank you, Mark. Um, Bibika, would you care to chip in on that one? Yes, and I, I think, thank you. Uh, I think yeah, as Thomas started with also saying today that uh, fertilizer has been produced for more than a hundred years. And hence, we have handled ammonia for quite, quite some years. And today, it's, ammonia is being transported in small, medium, large volumes all over the world. It's, it's not only used for fertilizer, but it's used in other chemical industries uh, as a refrigerant. So I think it's, it is existing measures on handling ammonia safety today, and it has quite good safety record, track record already. And I think that is what we need to, to build on, on, on really sharing this and utilizing this knowledge when we now go into new users and new users of ammonia. So I think the, the, the key here is really to, to utilize what we already have and the knowledge that is there and then to build on that and ensure that we have a safety culture, a safety leadership, and that we are committed to really do this in, in a safe way. And I think we are, as, as Yara and, and existing producers, we are actively, I mean, safety is something that we are more than happy to share and, and our experience on, and we are participating and we need to, to really look at how will it be different in these new users and to take that serious. So, Safety is, is something that we really are our top priority. Yes, and I think I think safety um, across the board, uh, hydrogen and its derivatives, uh, I think um, very, very often um, we're looked upon on the safety requirements of, uh, of our businesses. Um, and what we've shown over the years is that 
um, not only is it not new uh, and that safe handling of those substances has been going on for, for years, um, but that we've continued working and we will continue working on providing the necessary safety requirements because that's really the basis, I think, for, for our sectors. I mean, we need to uh, prove and handle in an adequate way um, the difficult, the different um, chemical substances. Um, thank you, um, Bibika. Um, now I'll turn to Mark, um, who um, outlined a bit previously um, the infrastructure uh, requirements um, and existing infrastructure within, uh, let's say, the Port Authority in, in Rotterdam, what could be done um, in terms with the existing infrastructure, what additional infrastructure could be needed, but essentially, I mean, on the... Um, on the uh, on the storage uh, side and, and handling within uh, the port authority, um, maybe now we could turn to another piece of of equipment and, and infrastructure, um, which has to do with ammonia uh, cracking. Um, so, sort of both in terms of costs as well as um, as uh, TRL for for large scale um, equipment. Um, what what are the developments at the moment in uh, the Rotterdam uh, Port Authority um, on that specific matter? And just maybe for our audience, um, that just implies then we're cracking um, ammonia um, in order to uh, to use the hydrogen for hydrogen applications. But ammonia can also be directly used. Um, so there are, there are sort of two two pathways a bit. Thank you, Mark. Yeah. Thank you, Stephen. Um, so, uh, to, to research exactly that question, um, we, we have launched a, a, a pre-feasibility study in the port in, in October, uh, just to look at uh, if it would be possible to have a very large central uh, cracker somewhere uh, in the port uh, to cope with the predicted uh, increase in, in ammonia um, in the future. So this is not the, the, the near term use because there we will develop uh, and, and companies will develop their own uh, pilot crackers or, or first crackers of sort of industrial size to, to deal with their um, uh, the demand uh, or maybe even as a service in a terminal. But we're really looking at very large quantities of ammonia being imported and then the need to be cracked. Uh, put it as hydrogen into the, the national and international hydrogen network. Um, and and if, you, if you look at that, um, it, it's actually quite interesting uh, to, to see uh, what sort of uh, results are, are coming out of that. Um, and so there was also uh, uh, quite a large interest from the uh, companies in and around the port uh, to participate into the study. So, uh, a, a large group of companies have joined the efforts to do this pre-feasibility study. Uh, think about uh, the, the large petrochemical companies, uh, energy companies, um, uh, industrial gas companies, and also, for example, uh, uh, a lot of the terminals uh, participated, including also some energy companies. So this, this group was uh, exactly, uh, uh, like you say, interested uh, in uh, the, the, the questions that you mentioned, like TRL levels and costs, etc. Um, so this was a study, and it was a pre-feasibility study, but still we wanted to to look uh, what capabilities there were. Um, there is a, a, a study is almost finished, and I'm sure we will uh, share some sort of an executive uh, summary in the future. Um, but uh, just to highlight. Uh, a, a, a few things that, that were found there. Um, for example, the TRL levels were, were actually quite high uh, uh, between the six and even nine. Um, so uh, that, that means that uh, some of the technology providers are really ready uh, to provide uh, larger installations in the, in the future. Uh, and, and also um, uh, there were quite a few uh, technology providers uh, participating uh, in, in the study. So that is that is encouraging news. That was something that was uh, really well uh, received. Uh, and another point in, in terms of cost, um, you know, as a percentage of the, the, the total uh, of the hydrogen produced, and I think this came back uh, also in the study that Joanna uh, presented uh, earlier, um, the percentage 
to do with capital investment and and uh, 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 yeah, ammonia production <laughs> uh, is is a, a fraction of the the cost of the uh, the the hydrogen uh, produced, uh, and that is again related to the electricity. Uh, price that you can get from renewables. So if you uh, import the uh, uh, ammonia uh, for a certain price, uh, even although the investment costs in a, in, a, in a plant like that are 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 very high in the in the, in the, the billions of, of euros, it it's still uh, uh, not uh, um, a, a determining factor. Uh, it will always make the the uh, the, the business case. I I think. Uh, we, we, we're not talking about uh, uh, a very large part of the, the total cost of the product. Yeah, thank you, Mark. That's, uh, that's very interesting. And I'm, and I'm sure many stakeholders uh, across Europe will be looking at, uh, at what you're doing and will want uh, to take a look at the results of, uh, of the study, I'm pretty sure. Um, so, so here we've been talking about um, cracking uh, ammonia uh, in order to retrieve the hydrogen um, again. Um, and I would say today we've predominantly talked about um, hydrogen um, as a feedstock for ammonia in the fertilizers um, industry, but um, ammonia can also directly be used um, as a fuel, uh, for example, in the maritime uh, sector. Uh, alongside, for example, methanol um, as well, uh, which could be another option um, of choice. Um, but um, could, could ammonia uh, actually replace uh, natural gas as a future fuel of choice for flexible, dispatchable power generation, which is a topic we have not yet mentioned. Uh, and I will hand over the floor to Joao to discuss it. Thanks. Um... Well, before I jump into the question uh, itself on power generation, um, we are we have also Mitsubishi build uh, Mitsubishi um, uh, shipbuilding working on ammonia uh, an ammonia carrier fueled by ammonia. So things are happening everywhere, and ammonia is really the the, the topic of the day across the MHI group. Uh, when it comes to power generation, the answer is yes. We can use um, uh, ammonia um, directly um, in a, in a, in our in our turbines. Um, if we understand and acknowledge that um, the commoditization of hydrogen means enabling the transport and trade at global scale, and that ammonia will be an energy carrier of choice, because as we already discussed, uh, has the international trade is there already. Um, for ammonia, then uh, uh, for small distances, maybe in hydrogen, we will have some pipelines. And for long distances, we see uh, uh, indeed the sea transport coming in. And when we come to ports, and we discuss this now cracking uh, possibility, but when we bring huge amounts of uh, ammonia, clean ammonia, into these ports, uh, and we can use it directly without. Uh, cracking it, so avoiding costs, not only costs, financial costs, but also energy losses uh, that come with it and can use it directly, that would be uh, a game changer, I think. Um, so we can absolutely use ammonia to replace natural gas uh, uh, without necessarily compromising on operational flexibility uh, and efficiency. Um, we are currently working uh, on the commercialization uh, 40 megawatt uh, class uh, gas turbine, the H25, um, capable to burn 100% uh, ammonia, and the target date for the commercialization is 20 uh, to address uh, different issues that come with it, of course. Um, and uh, we are doing these uh, a bit all over the world. We have um, uh, already projects, uh, 60 megawatt CCGT in Singapore. It's a very interesting case for the value chain of ammonia and the application of ammonia um, because it involves the infrastructure, so the ports, the shipping, uh, and, and the... We, this is possible, absolutely. And we are, we are doing it. 
Thank you, Joe. Um, yes, it's it's interesting to get um, to get that side of uh, of the developments as well, uh, and the direct use of of uh, of ammonia um, in in power generation. Uh, true that I think um, maybe countries in in Asia have been looking into uh, that possibility uh, a bit before us. Um, but but it is it is clearly one of the possibilities on the power generation side of things, and in the context of global trade of ammonia. It is quite an interesting pathway, um, I believe, as well. Um, but when it comes to power, then the, we have a subsequent question. Um, how can we avoid the uh, NOx emissions uh, that come associated with the burning of ammonia? A uh, process that would normally occur during the production of electricity from ammonia gas turbines. Yes, that's an excellent question. And it's it's a... It's an important question. Um, there are indeed uh, NOx emissions um, with, uh, when we burn ammonia to produce uh, power. Um, but this is an essential question for us to comply with environmental requirements. And what we are doing on that front is uh, to, 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 to side it. So on the one hand, we are, it's quite technical, so <laughs> brace for it. Um, on the one hand, we have a combustor that we are uh, developing, and that's the one we expect to have commercialized in 2025, which is a two-stage combustor. Don't ask me to give you all the details. My colleagues would be thrilled to do it. Um, but just that two-stage combustor will be able to address um, the, um, uh, the, the, the NOx emissions already. So it will be able to decrease those, those emissions already before they reach the stack. And of course, then at the stack, you have uh, air quality control systems uh, for NOx, and there we have um, a selective uh, catalyst reduction process um, at the stack. So there are two measures to deal, to deal with, uh, with that situation. And again, of course, we are doing these uh, uh, very actively in Asia Pacific, because it's also in that region that ammonia is produced in the biggest share worldwide. Uh, and there are certain dependencies and certain regional uh, um, characteristics that make it, uh, but we think that in Europe, we are going in the same direction. Um, so there will be also opportunities of replicability here. And there are opportunities already we are exploring in Chile. There is with coal, so different, uh, different um, options. Okay, please, uh, please to hear that the uh, the NOx issues are, are on your radar and that they're build, being dealt with uh, through, through various uh, various technologies. Um, and in in what kind of countries or geographies um, will the most likely be uptake of green ammonia power generation? Um, in your view, you must have a quite a good overview uh, globally where those uh, where those projects are, whether they be yours or maybe some of your your competitors um, as well. What would be your take, sort of globally? Uh, so, as we as we discussed, Asia Pacific. So, of course, Japan has a number of of uh, is looking into it very seriously. Uh, there is a security of supply uh, issue. Uh, 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 it's it's always uh, we have always to look at the geographies and their resources and their capabilities. So we have we are looking into Indonesia. So it's always islands and isolated remote areas. Um, and then, of course, ports. We don't think uh, necessarily that there will be a widespread use of this technology everywhere, uh, equally in the world, but uh, where the ports, where these green ammonia will come in, and there is the infrastructure, there are the, the, the assets already, um, then this is a possibility. And again, the islands, remote, which have less access to other resources. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, we are um, bang on time, uh, basically. Um, so unfortunately, so I've seen there are a few questions in the Q&A that remain unanswered. We won't have the opportunity to take them now. Um, but for our audience, uh, we will write them down and provide you answers um, in writing. Um, so we will do that as, um, as a follow up. Um, now, maybe just a few um, closing remarks uh, from uh, from my side. Um, I think, I mean, what is quite clear here is that, well, clean hydrogen and clean, clean ammonia are clearly two sides of the same coin. Um, and this has been um, 
uh, discussed um, quite a, quite a bit, and and it's and it's quite clear that the two are intrinsically linked, um, both from a cost structure, but also CO two emission reductions um, across Europe, um, but also globally. Um, we've had the chance today to uh, discuss with our experts um, the different aspects of the value chain. Um, when it comes to uh, ammonia production, but also uh, the infrastructure that is required um, and the various end uses, whether it be um, as a feedstock um, or uh, direct use for, for power generation and even uh, potentially as a maritime, um, maritime uh, fuel. Um, but I think what's important to realize is that there is um, massive potential um, for for this sector, whether it be domestic and globally linked to, I mean, the increased trade uh, of, of ammonia um, that will arise. Um, but there are a number of um, concerns and challenges, I think, that which have been outlined here during our, during our conversation. And I think we as Europeans, um, the challenges um, are very much on the legislative side, um, that there is quite a lot of complexity, uh, that the files are very much linked to one another. And I think importantly, um, that we need clarity and speed. Um, I think that was that was made uh, very, very clear um, today um, on that side. And all the more so because um, we are not, uh, our continent is not sort of in isolation. It is in competition with the rest of the world. Um, and I think that, well, the European Union, when it comes to, to hydrogen, um, has really had a head start. I mean, uh, the European Union invested in hydrogen technologies um, 14 to 16 years ago um, and had a, a technological edge, which I think we still have. But the thing is, the move the the world is moving on and the world is catching up fast um and we see a lot of technological developments um in uh in asia uh, obviously where there are quite a bit of um equipment manufacturers um and now the wake up of of the us and yes the big talk is now um the us playing catch up with with um, quite a straightforward um mechanism I think also, I mean, linked to the Infl Infl um, Inflation Reduction Act, um, well, yes, of course, it's creating vacuum and a lot of noise, but there are um, a number of elements that will still need to be sorted uh, from there and um, as well, and they will need uh, certain regulatory um, and certain, certain standards um, in order to make their system work. So it's not to say that I mean, they fixed it all and put huge buckets of money and that's where it's all going to go. I don't think it's quite fair to say that. Um, yet we do have quite a few things to sort out in Europe, but I think we, we are going in, in, um, in, in, the, right, uh, in the right direction. Um, and then I would like to uh, finally uh, thank my team uh, for producing uh, such an extensive uh, report. Uh, quite a bit of work has gone into it, um, and therefore I would really encourage you all, as I said at the beginning, to download the report, uh, but also continue the conversation uh, with us and, and with our team. Um, we would gladly um, continue. Um, and then finally, I would like to thank our audience uh, for being here today in very large numbers. I think at some point we had uh, about 380 um, uh, participants, um, so that's great. So that shows really that um, the, the ammonia discussion um, linked to hydrogen is, is extremely important and that it needs to be uh, dealt with uh, in this in this complex um, regulatory system uh, together with hydrogen and other carriers. Um, and that we here at Hydrogen are um, devoted and adamant um, to um, really um, push forward the further development of the ammonia uh, sector uh, here within Europe, but also um, ensure the competitiveness um, globally. Um, so that, uh, then I'll finally just a, a bit of housekeeping. Uh, so as I said at the beginning, uh, the webinar uh, will be uh, available. Uh, the recording will be available on um, the AMOA. Um, 
And just to let you know that uh, the next uh, H2 talk um, will be on the 25th of April, and it will be on uh, the role of hydrogen-based fuels in the decarbonization of EU aviation. Um, and so before saying uh, goodbye, I would like to thank our panelists. Uh, thank you. I think you provided um, very uh, comprehensive, uh, straight to the point uh, insights, uh, which our entire sector can, can work on. Um, and as I said, let's continue the discussion. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Stephen. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.